Greetings. I am so glad that you've, you're tuning in today, and I, and I pray that you are doing well and uh, in surviving the Christmas season, getting ready for the holidays. And, and uh, um, you know, we, we just want you to know once again, I'm getting people to let me know they're, they're watching, and I appreciate that. And I hope you, you keep letting me know, all right? Love hearing from you. I love hearing from those that are watching, all right? Hey, why don't we start with a word of prayer, and uh, why don't we begin as we look at God's word today? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we pause in our schedule, I hope that we, that we don't just pause to stop and read the Bible and, and we call it a pause, but I pray that it would be something that, that soaks into us, that's something that we think through and think on during our day. And Lord, I pray that as we look at this, at your, at, at your story today, that you would you'd talk to us, help, help us to, to see this as more than just... Um, just as information or a story, especially when it comes to Christmas, Christmas Lord, I pray that, that we would be able to, to maybe see it in, in a way that we've never seen it before or be reminded of something that we need this season. Lord, would you help us as we prepare to celebrate the birth of our Savior? And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we begin, I want to, I want to begin with uh, a passage from Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 12. It's, it's part of the Christmas story. It's just a, just a little chunk of it. So let's go ahead and see what, what Luke tells us about the birth of Jesus, all right? He says this, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find the babe wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Now let me just do this. Let's go ahead and re- take a moment to review. We're, we're in the Advent season. We're on the third Sunday of Advent. I can't believe it's already the third Sunday of Advent. We covered peace was last week. Before that, we talked about hope. And it, I don't know if you remember any of those, those uh, themes. Um, but last week, as we looked at peace, one of the things that, that it's been kind of, I tried to do is, is, is I tried to reflect over the last uh, the last week of what did I what did I preach about and what did I mean by that and so uh, as I um, as I reflected on it let me just remind us that uh, the peace is is what I said was is it's an enticing idea you know it's something that we like the idea of a world peace oh it's wonderful it's, it and yet the world what they offer us in the form of peace is by substances. The form of peace that they try to offer us is by positive thinking. The peace that they try to offer us is in, in social systems, and, and yet Jesus is the one who offers peace. And so we look towards that, and yet peace still is one of those things that we, that we chase after, that we, uh, that we long for, that we would love to, be, uh, to have in us, and, and we'd love to have, and yet that peace just continues to be elusive. But as I thought about it this week, as I thought about kind of what does peace signify, well, I mean, why is it such a, one of those things that's hard to grab a hold of, but we, we desire it, we would love to have it. Well, here's what I realized is, is that um, Peace is so, is so closely connected with rest. Rest in, for our souls, uh, rest in, in our bodies. Rest. There is something about peace that we long for. And so as I reflected, what I, what I began to think is, is, you know, those places that I always kind of look for peace, that I wish I could find it, that I wish I could have it, um, my to-do list. My, my, the things that I want to get done around the house is one of those things. And, and what, what happens is, is that pretty soon that, that list kind of starts to eat away at me. And as it eats away at me, I, I'm, I lose any ability to kind of rest well. So I come home and, from work and I just I hit the ground running uh, when I get there and I try to get a whole bunch of different things done. And in my head I think, oh, if I could just, if I could just get that list done, 
then I could, I could come home and I could sit down and rest. Oh, what a great thought that would be. Oh, it'd be awesome. You know, when, in, with my job, when, when there are tasks in my job, I, there are tasks in my job that I don't really want to do. And, and when I think about those, when I, there, some days I wake up and I'm like, oh, I'm not looking forward to doing that, right? There are these days where I go, oh, you know, one of these days I'm going to get to retire. Now, it's still a long ways away, but not as long as it, it used to be. And so um, I, that idea of retirement or that idea of rest, how about when our relationships are strained and we long for repair? So that we don't have to worry anymore. We don't have to have that stress in that relationship anymore. We long for that rest. We, we long for that peace. There is something in us that longs for rest. Look at, look at what God did. In, in creation, on the seventh day, He what? He rested. There's something in us, there's something about Him that, 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 that rest is something we need. We long for it. In fact, and if we connect peace and rest together, we long for this peace. Scripture tells us that, that uh, one day we will enter His rest. It's this it's idea of peace. We long for it. And so peace is something we long for. But it's, it really is truly a longing for, for heaven. Real rest. Real rest is, is a gift from Jesus that he offers to us. Even though, even though our heart, there are hardships, even though there are pain, even though there are difficulties. And so that was, that was just that idea that I had of as I reflected through the week about peace is is that, that rest that we long for that is coming one day when we go to heaven. Well, today we move on to our next uh, theme, which would be uh, the, the theme of joy. Now, uh, this year has been challenging, okay? This has been, a, this has been an interesting year, maybe, maybe more than any of the previous years before me in my life. And uh, I don't know if anybody else feels that, but it's, you know, it's joked about, you know, oh, here's 2020, and oh, I can't wait till 2020 is over, like something magical is going to happen at midnight on December 31st. In fact, sometimes we maybe even blame 2020 for, uh, uh, for, for all these difficulties. Is that, I mean, is that really how things work, right? I mean, it, it, is it really a year's fault? Sometimes it seems like it. But I, a lot of times, it's just the way we kind of see things. Here's, here's what I begin to see is this. 2020 clarifies the state of my heart. It has clarified the state of my heart. I can't, I can't look back over 2020 and, and not admit. And there's some places in my heart that, that aren't, aren't good, that need work. 2020 has clarified that, that I don't that I don't take seriously my need for hope. I mean, that was two weeks ago. It clarifies that, that, that where I was putting my hope, where I've been putting my hope is misplaced. 2020 has clarified that. 2020 has clarified that, that I see that, 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 that I have a desire for peace. Because as I've watched the turmoil in our country, it, it is... Is, made me desire peace so much more. 2020 has also revealed the state of my joy. So I like the last two topics, joy, uh, hope and peace. I've realized that I'm actually not very knowledgeable about joy. I mean, it's a word I'd, I've used. It's a word that I would even say, but, but I'm not sure that I really have a, as good of a grasp on it as I should. In fact, I maybe, just maybe, I've been a little bit oblivious to joy. I, I, in fact, maybe I even go through my day and, and don't even, it's not even, a, it's just kind of, it happens by accident. Something good happens that, that gives me a, a sense of joy. And so, if that's what I think of joy, you know, then maybe, just maybe, my, I, I need to clarify my picture of joy. 
What, what I need, what I need to understand and see is, is, is a better, better picture of what joy is. I mean, if it is just these moments where um, I have something good happen and I, and I sense this thing inside of me. I mean, there are times when my kids do it. It's not something I can plan. It's not something that I can like, you know, oh, if they would just do this and this, right? But, but let me give you a story. A couple months ago, um, I, we, were, we were all at home and... and uh, Ellie w- w- had this part of a song that she was just kind of, um, she's just repeating over and over again. It's a, it's a song that Ron's worship team sings, and um, uh, the, the, the line in it that she just kept repeating was, I know, I know, you've never lost a battle, you've never lost a battle. And then she just went over it again, I know, I know, you've never lost a battle, you've never lost a battle. And she just kept repeating it over. I finally, I, I'm like, oh, I got to get my phone out because this is one of those moments that, that I want to capture, that I want to be able to look back on because there was something in that moment that I was like, my heart was, was, was being filled. There was something there. And I would say in reflection, that's probably w- w- kind of what joy is. And so I, I recorded it and, and uh, Sabrina, as she was there while, while Ellie was singing the song, that... Uh, she goes, well, well, who's never lost a battle? And, and Ellie's first response was, I don't know. And so Sabrina asked her, you know, um, well, who's strong enough to never lose a battle? And she kind of gets this smile on her face, and she says, God. And so uh, Sabrina goes, so who's the song about? And, and she goes, God. And, and for me, I, I don't know about any, of, any other parents, but that is probably, uh, that's the most important thing. For my kids, to have them have that stuff instilled in them, to have a have a love for God, to have a desire to follow God, and and to and and to trust in Him. And so, is that as a child, it's a beautiful scene to see, and it filled me with joy. But it wasn't something that I was able to manufacture. It wasn't something that I was able to to come up with. I, I truly believe that, that that was a moment of joy for me. But it, it's this thing that just kind of happened accidentally. I mean, I think sometimes, though, we go, so what's the formula? I mean, how do we get joy, right? I mean, and, and I, don't, I don't know the formula. And I'm not sure that, um, that most of us know the formula. Some of you might be sitting there thinking, oh, I know the formula. I know, how to, I know how to fill up on joy. I know how to have joy. And, you know, you just need three to five worship songs and you're ready to go. You're full of joy then. Uh, you just need to, do, to let go and let God and you'll be full of joy. The, the, the perfect seven-step procedure will, will produce joy in you. You know what? I don't think we can wrap it in that neat of a package. Because what that does is that tells us that we can somehow manipulate, manipulate God even. So as I sat down, though, I think about joy. And I think about, is there a formula? What I recognize is joy is not something that we can manufacture because it doesn't come from within us. It's not something just inherent in us. Joy is something that it has to be discovered. I, I love that term. It has to be discovered. It's almost like it, what it really means is it, it, it has, to be, has to be unearthed. If we're going to find it, if it uh, we, have to, we have to move things in order to find it. <coughs> so... Joy is not something that we manufacture because it doesn't come from within. All right? Now, joy is, is, is something that has to be discovered. We, that we don't create joy, we unearth it. Okay? We unearth it or we, we find it. And, and as I process joy, well, the other last one is this. It is something we, we reach for. Something we lean into. Joy. So as we as we as we put joy in those in that context, 
in that picture. It begins to kind of change the way I would describe it. It's not something that comes from within us. It's something we have to discover. It's something we kind of unearth. It's, it is something that we reach for. Here's what C.S. Lewis said, okay? C.S. Lewis said it this way. And, and, uh, by the way, it was also anticipated. But C.S. Lewis says this, all right? All joy reminds it n- is never a possession, always a desire, or something longer ago, or further away, or still about to be. All joy emphasizes our pilgrim status, always reminds, beckons, awakens desire. Our best havings are wantings. Now, that's one of those statements. I put it on your handout because it's one of those statements that I think has to kind of soak in a little bit. It's an interesting statement. I think that C.S. Lewis uh, has the ability to write a children's book and then has the the ability to write these deep deep thoughts, these theological thoughts. As as I process what he says, that it is something longer ago or further away, so behind us or in front of us, we're still about to be. I think what I realize is, is that I think I have made joy too fragile. Because when I say, well, the, the, these people or these situations just kind of suck the joy out of me, w- what I've really done is I've made joy kind of this this fragile thing that I, 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 can't, uh, I can't have, you know, rely on. But what does Scripture say? Scripture says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. There is something about joy that is a strength. And if Lewis is right about joy, then all my reasons for lacking joy, they're just really excuses. So using this different image that, that, that I've gotten from, from, from C.S. Lewis, uh, let's look at a few passages of Scripture, okay? So let's look at, as we do, let's look at the first one. We're going we're gonna to look at the story we already read. We're just going to look at that little bit that the angel said to the, to, the, uh, um, to the shepherds, all right? So the shepherds are out in the field, and, and all of a sudden this, this heavenly host shows up, right? And and what does it say? It says this, the, the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. All right, we're going we're gonna to continue with the rest of it in just a moment. But, but look at this, it says, great, will cause great joy. That statement, will cause great joy, stopped me. I thought, okay, that, you know what, my, the definition for, for that needs, may need to be corrected slightly as I look at it. You know, different translations say, um, will, you know, will cause great joy, I bring you good news of great joy. Uh, so just like the two weeks before, I feel like, man, I need to, I need to redefine joy for myself. And uh, uh, because I don't necessarily have a real defined way of explaining it. Think about it. How would you explain, how would you define joy? See, one of the things that goes through my head is, is the old song when I was a kid growing up, I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart down in my heart, right? And, and so we, <laughs> but it doesn't, descri- doesn't explain it, does it? Doesn't, doesn't actually define it. We've got this thing or we have this opportunity for this thing, but what is it? And so I looked, oh, let's, let's do this. So we'll cause great joy. So I looked up the word, we'll cause great joy uh, in the Greek from, from that passage. And here's what I found. S- the, the word for joy that, that, that the angels used here is source of joy. Well, wow, that's helpful, isn't it? Source of joy. So um, 
will cause great joy, will be a source of joy. So I have the good news. So when you have a definition that uses the word in the definition, it's kind of like a circular uh, discussion, and it's really hard to get anywhere because you're just going around in a circle. So what happens is you have to dig just a little bit deeper. And with the Greek especially, um, you, you, there's always a root word, okay? Uh, there's always this way to, okay, so what's, what word did, it, did this word come from? And so the word that they used in, that the angels used was a source of joy, source of joy. So the root word of that narrows it down to just joy. And, and joy is this, right? You ready for this? Joy is the awareness of God's grace, the awareness of God's grace or favor. It's grace recognized. This good news will be a source of awareness of God's grace and favor. So the, as the angels stand there and, and they tell the shepherds, I bring you good news that will be a source of awareness of God's grace and favor. To have an awareness of God's grace and favor produces something in us that others can see. Joy will create something in us that others see. What it creates is not joy. What it creates is rejoice, rejoicing. But it creates something in us that others will see and that others will desire to have for themselves. I'm not talking about these people that are bub- over bubbly and, and kind of annoying, right? I'm not talking about these people that, that we're like, oh, if, if that's what it looks like to, to be a Christian, that's embarrassing. But there should be a transformation. There should be something in us. In us. It's, it's almost as if, if we w- truly receive God's grace, we will be a person who rejoices. We will be a person who seems to, to not be devastated, discouraged by the world around us, but who, one who is this, just has this ability, there's an upbeatness to them, there's a, there is this uh, not defeated, having a source of joy should capture our attention. Now, so let's finish that statement, okay? Let's finish what the, what the angel said to, to them, okay? So a source of joy is, is a re- remembering or discovering that Jesus is, is born to you. Now, here's what I want us to see. We look at that passage. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. If we will receive it, If we receive him, it will be, he will be a source of awareness of God's grace and favor. Look at this passage. There's something I didn't notice, and, and I kind of already gave it away a little bit, but there's something I didn't notice um, when I first read it. Actually, when I've read it for, I don't know, 51 years now, that, that, I, that I caught. What stands out to me, the angel says, today, in the town of David, A Savior has been born to you. You. That is the thing that captured my attention. How is this a source of joy? Well, I read that that the the message that the the angel gives, and what I see is that, that the source of joy, the reason it's a source of joy is because Jesus has been born to you. See, I've always kind of read it, and I've always missed that statement. I've always read it. I mean, we could just read it this way. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born. He is Messiah. He is the Messiah, the Lord. But that's not what the angel said. Do you think that just possibly that when God communicates something, that he's chosen his words on purpose? And so as I read that, as I let that sink in, what I, what I believe we need to hear is this is a source of joy because a Savior has been born to you. That is a personal pronoun. It is a personal message. Now, I used to kind of think, oh, well, was, you know, Jesus was born to Israel. He was kind of born to the whole world because he's the Savior of the world, right? 
But here's the angel talking to a group of shepherds, and he doesn't say, all of you. He doesn't say, to y'all. He doesn't say, to the whole world. Somehow, as he speaks to the shepherds, he is including everyone. Because Jesus, quite honestly, he was born to Joseph and Mary. And Jesus is actually, quite honestly, was born to all of Israel, right? So, so if we were just to say, oh, well, well the, the angel just said that, you know, it was born to the, the shepherds when he said to you. He was just talking to the shepherds. Well, that doesn't make sense, does it? Because Jesus was born to way more than just them. And so do we hear it? He was born to you. See, as we approach Christmas, do we see the birth of Jesus as born to you? See, this should be a cause for great joy. This isn't about something happening that, that we are detached from. It's personal. It reminds us of Jesus being born to us. We as we celebrate Christmas, it's a reminder. It needs to be that he's born to us. So what is one way that we can become aware of God's favor or grace? Well, here it is. Discover that Jesus is born to you. Okay? Discover that Jesus is born to you. Now, let's move to the next one. Number two, the second passage we're going to look at. The second passage we're going to look at is this. Consider it pure joy, my brothers. It's James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers whenever, and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be com- mature and complete not lacking anything. Now, this is a passage of Scripture that um, with, my, with a, my small group, we've kind of been, we've been going over, that we have been looking at. And uh, as we did, we, uh, we studied kind of the, most, of the, most of it. We studied most of this passage. And so um, as we studied it, we... Uh, we noticed the trials, and we, we all shared in this idea that we, we don't like trials. Uh, we shared in the idea of that, that, that trials are producing something. We, we, got, we understand that, 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 that the trials are a testing of our faith. And so as we studied that, we, we, I learned a lot, actually. As I slowed down and I looked at this passage, what I began to see is, is man, this is, a, this is a really good passage for me. In fact, what James goes on to say later is, is, so we'll be complete, not lacking anything. Then he goes on to say, but if anybody lacks wisdom, they should ask for it. And this is the best part of that one, is that uh, because he, pray to God who, who, who finds no fault, who gives generously. We can ask for wisdom in the middle of our trials. We can ask for wisdom. Be, wisdom. He gives uh, generously without finding fault. And I love that, but here's what I skipped when I, when, I recon- when I slowed down this week as I read this passage, all of a sudden I recognized I actually just kind of skipped over pure joy. I just, I just kind of, yeah, so, so how I, what happens when we skip over a word sometimes, we kind of just, inter- we just kind of fill in the blanks with something else. No, you, you, should, you should be happy or, or you feel good about, don't, don't get discouraged about the trials. Appreciate it. Be glad because of trials. I overlooked it. But let's go back to our, our, uh, how, what joy really is. Joy is, um, is an awareness or, or a recognition of God's grace. An experiencing of God's grace. So listen to it now when James says this. Consider it an opportunity to be aware or to experience God's grace or favor when you face trials. 
trials a source of joy? To produce perseverance, this is why it's a source of joy. Because what trials do is, is they test our faith. Now, testing of our faith, it is not like God doesn't test us to see that so he can fail us. See, I had a, a lot of years in college, and I think that my first years in college really shaped the way I kind of pictured tests. That, that it felt like in college, in, in my first few years of college, that, that the tests were the, the professor's way of, of deciding whether or not he was going to pass or fail you, based on what you knew, right? I mean, it would be really easy to assume that, I think. But what I've come to discover is that actually, when it comes to education, a good teacher tests their students so that either the student or the teacher can say, look at where I'm missing something. Look at what I actually need to learn. And so it shows us what we need to learn. And so that that's an area that we can focus on. Consider it pure Consider it an opportunity to be aware of God's grace when you face trials because it's going gonna, it's gonna to test your faith. It's gonna, faith. it's going to show you the places that need, that need to be built up. Not, not so we can have the finger pointed at us, not so, not so Jesus can shake his head in disgust of us, but so that we can learn, so that we can experience his grace, his Shaping us, his developing our faith is an experience of God's grace. To produce, and, and the testing of our faith, it produces perseverance, and perseverance must complete its task so that we may be mature, complete, not lacking anything. Imagine this. I don't know about anybody else, but being complete, that appeals to me. Man, I want it for me. I want it for my wife. I want it for my kids. I want it for my church family, that we would be complete, not lacking anything. So the second way, okay, the second way that we can discover joy is, rec- uh, is recognizing God's grace in trials. In trials. Because they have a greater purpose. Because trials have a greater purpose. Now let's move on to our next passage we're going to look at for joys. It's found in Psalm 51. Now let me give you just a quick history of Psalm 51, all right? So David um, has this little thing that he, that he decides to do. And, and he, um, you know, he, he sees this woman. Calls her in as the king. He has, I guess, thinks he has the right to do this. His servants went and got her, brought her, and and he ended up impregnating her. He had adultery. He had he committed adultery, and to make things worse, he in, in an effort to kind of cover up his adultery, what he does is now he calls uh, he, his her Bathsheba's husband is is part of the military, and so uh, David calls the calls the um, or sends a letter for for. Re- for Uriah to come back. And, and the idea was is that, that uh, Bathsheba and him would come together and, and she would then be pregnant and no one would know it was David's. And da- so David's in this effort of hiding over, over his sin. To make things worse, now David, he, he, Uriah was a man of honor. He wouldn't even go in and, and be with his wife because his, because his fellow uh, warriors, his fellow um, uh, army people were out in battle and he felt guilty and felt wrong for being at home. And so um, David gives up and sends him back, but he sends him a le- with a letter to the commanding officer to put, basically to put Uriah on the, on the front lines and then pull back. So he's standing out there all by himself, and sure enough, he ends up getting killed. Now, th- there's, a, there's an out. David could say, well, I didn't kill him, but he sure set it up so that, that Uriah would die. And he was, his plan was is to, to just kind of, Go on through life. Nathan the prophet comes to David and he tells him a story about two guys and, and one guy's a wealthy guy, the other guy's not a wealthy guy. And, and the, one, the wealthy guy um, has a lot of sheep. The, the not wealthy guy has, has just has this one special lamb. Wealthy guy ends up having friends come over and he doesn't want to sacrifice their, he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to lose any of his sheep. So he comes and he basically takes this lamb from, from the other guy. 
they slaughter it, they eat it, and, and, and in the story Nathan, that Nathan is telling David, David becomes, I mean, he is furious. And it was at that point that Nathan says, that man is you. And David didn't have, to, didn't have to have an explanation. David knew what Nathan was talking about. David knew that, that what Nathan was talking about was the adultery and killing Uriah and, and, and that he was wrong. And what David did in response, I truly believe that this is one of the reasons David gets the title of man after God's own heart, is that David repented. And in his repentance, he wrote Psalm 51. So Psalm 51 is, is David's repentance after he's, uh, after he's caught by Nathan. And, and, and it's a beautiful psalm. And, and at, the, at, at uh, verses 10, and tw- 10 to 12 is what we're going to look at, okay? So here's what I want us to see. This is what David writes as he is, re- as he is uh, convicted and, and repenting. He says this, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. As I read that, what I, I kind of remember C.S. Lewis's definition, right, of something long ago that, that, that what David is talking about is he wants that restoration of that, that memory of, of what God has done in his life. David had something. He had this joy that he wasn't living in right now. See, God's, what, what, what David recognizes is that God's salvation was his source of joy. And sin had taken, taken the joy from him. Sin had taken joy from him. David's repentance it included a plea for God to not give up on him. It included a plea for, for, him to, for God to restore joy. It included this, um, this request. God, would you, would you help me to experience your grace? Remember joy and experiencing grace? That he would be aware of it, that he would sense it, that he would rest in it. Here we have David. He's a man who is, who is weary of hiding his sin. A man who recognizes that he is lacking joy. And he wants it back. A way to become aware of or experience God's grace is through repentance. Through repentance. David goes on to say later in, the, in Psalm 51, he says, A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. It's not because he wants us to be miserable in life, but he wants us to, f- to truly find joy. God wants us to have joy. What, what do we want for our kids? Do we want our kids to have joy? Absolutely. God wants us to have joy. That's why trials, that's why repentance, that's why birth born unto you. This is not some prosperity gospel. This is not some thing that says that God just wants you to be happy, that if you'll do this, this, and this, that God will, will fix everything for you. No, he wants you to find joy because of trials. He wants you to find joy through repentance. Joy isn't simply being happy. It's being grounded in our source of experiencing God's grace or favor. If we make joy about something other than God's grace and favor, it's not joy. Think about it. The fruit of the Spirit, within the description of the fruit, is Joy. There is something about the fruit that that is described as joy.
we must realize that we will experience or be aware of God's grace when we face trials, when we repent, and when we receive Jesus' birth as unto you. So joy is the awareness of experiencing God's favor. Therefore, to rejoice is to express that experience of God's favor. What is rejoicing? Rejoicing is expressing the experience, that awareness of God's favor. So how does His grace affect you? How does His grace affect you? How does it change the way you respond to the world around you? Do you have that joy, 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 joy down in your heart? Are you aware of His grace in the trials? Are you aware of His grace in repentance? Are you aware of His grace? Because because Jesus is born to you. It's not a formula. But remember what I said, grace is, a, is something that needs to be discovered. So we've got, a, we've got kind of a map. C.S. Lewis said, it always reminds, beckons and awakens. It always reminds, it beckons and awakens. As I think about the celebration of Christmas, it's about the birth of Christ. It's about that one day the Savior is going to return. And it's about today. It reminds us, it beckons us, and it awakens us today. This Advent, this Advent we look back at His birth. This Advent we are awakened by repentance. And this Advent it beckons us in trials because it calls us to where God is taking us to completion and ultimately that's heaven well may may God make you aware of his grace when you face trials may you experience God's grace when you repent and may you soak in the birth of Jesus as he is born unto you this Christmas. Let me end with Paul's words in Philippians chapter 4. We looked at chapter 4, verses 6 through 9 last week. Let's just back up a little bit. And he says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. Would you pray with me please as we, as we conclude? Lord Jesus, I pray that, that, that we would rejoice, but that it would be a real rejoicing, that it would be something that, that we, were, we are filled with joy because we are aware and we, are, we recognize and we are experiencing your grace, your favor. That somewhere along the way, somehow, even in trials, we can experience your favor. That somehow, that, that when we repent rather than accusation, somehow you, you are able to to wrap your arms around us and restore to us what we lost because of sin. And I pray that as Christmas quickly approaches, we would recognize this is a very personal moment. We are celebrating you born to us, to me. And may that fill us with joy. And I pray this in Jesus' name. All right, once again, thank you so much for uh, tuning in. Let me just say next Sunday, the 20th, the 20th is our children's program. We're going to be in the gym, and uh, I'm not sure if we're going to be able to stream or not, so, so you may keep an eye out for it, but uh, 
um, just different venues. Sometimes it's getting all that to work in a different spot doesn't doesn't always work the way we'd like it to. And so, um, it, you won't see a sermon on on uh, online next week. All right. Well, once again, I'm glad.